we're talking about managing fungus gnats in production nurseries. Firstly, we're going to talk briefly about the project under which this webinar is funded. We'll talk about fungus gnat biology, damage, about the effects of growing media on fungus gnat survival, cultural practices, and monitoring and biological and chemical control. So you'll see this slide a few times through the webinar. Right, this webinar is part of that project there, the project name you can read. Other aspects of the project which are important for you are that you receive six free diagnostic samples per year. Now, just raise your hand if you sometimes have plant health problems that might be caused by a pest or a disease that you may not be able to identify. So if there's a problem with the plant and you don't know what it is, yep, some of you are raising your hands. Okay, you can send those samples to Grow Help Australia. We will triage them, we will run tests, we will send you a report. You get six free samples per year of the project until the end of 2025. We are also updating fact sheets, creating new fact sheets and other resources, including these webinars. And we're doing some research into nursery hygiene and pest and disease incidents. That uh, research is ongoing and uh, we'll, we'll be getting collecting a lot of results and uh, getting those out to you, hopefully starting next year. Okay. A lot of our fact sheets are at this FMS, the, the Nursery Production, the Australian Plant Production Standard website. This website has so many fact sheets and resources available to you. If you're a plant production nursery, have a look at the technical information that is available to you at a later time. And we'll be sending you a, links to some of these websites after the webinar, probably tomorrow or this afternoon. Okay, fungus gnat biology. So there are a number of species of fungus gnats, mainly in the genus Rhodesia. There are a couple of other genera that are sometimes pests in production nurseries. But in Australia, there was a survey completed uh, some years back and it found that it almost all of the production nursery fungus gnats were these two species and mostly this impatience. The species itself isn't that important because the biology is quite similar across the different species, but it is interesting to note that some of the main species that are pests overseas are different from the ones we have, though impatience is also a pest overseas, but not all of them. We don't seem to have all of the ones in Australia compared to what's overseas. Anyway, they all tend to prefer temperatures between about 15 and 30 degrees. They all have many generations per year. They all can have all stages present. So eggs, larvae, pupae, and adults present at any given time. And they complete their life cycle in about three to four weeks. So fungus gnats are flies. So from the order Diptera, same as mosquitoes, house flies, you know, little biting midges and a whole slew of other different types of flies. They only have one pair of wings, as all flies that have wings only have one pair of wings. And these, they're about three to four millimeters long. Who can't recognize a, does anyone have trouble recognizing a fungus gnat in their production area? Um, well, I'll point out a little bit more. In the wing, they're zigzagging. In your production nursery, they're zigzagging around. They tend to live for seven to 10 days. The adults themselves don't feed on plants. Okay, so no one raised their hand, so everyone's pretty much familiar with fungus gnats. There are a couple of other fly species that can be confused, but uh, for the most part, it's good that most people recognize it. So females can lay about 100 to 200 eggs and they lay them on the surface or in cracks and crevices of the growing media. The eggs are white, very small, and they tend to lay them in wet media over dry media. Just trying to move forward. It's, there we go. 
So now the eggs hatch, larvae take about two weeks to grow six to eight millimeters long. So when they first hatch, they're very small. You'll have trouble seeing them without magnification and they will run away, well, slither. They'll move away from, from you if they detect light and whatnot. They are white to translucent, a bit wormy, but they have a distinct black head capsule. So if you, some other invertebrates that you might find, various worms, they might look similar or other insect larvae, they may look similar, but this black head, that slimy worm-like body, it's hard to see segments. That will help you uh, work out that it is a fungus gnat larva. They don't have legs is another one because they're fly larvae, no fly larvae have legs. And their mouth parts, they tend to shoot those mouth parts out and macerate and sort of suck up their food. Now they tend to be in the top five, two to five centimeters of the media. However, they can be deeper in the media. They may even be at the bottom, particularly near the drainage holes, but they can be throughout the media in a container. They do tend to pupate on or near the surface, and then those pupae will emerge as an adult after about a week. The larval stage is the damaging stage, and they'll tend to consume more food as they get larger. However, as the name suspect, su suggests, fungus gnats are actually primarily fungal feeders. So that's part of the reason why they are, they are a major pest of the mushroom industry. They tend to feed on bacteria, yeast, and other dead, decaying organic matter. Their survival is significantly improved in the presence of those types of organisms, particularly fungi. They will, however, as you well know, feed on fine hair roots of plants and also tend to, to feed on small roots. They may sometimes feed up the cuttings. If, like if you have a massive infestation and particularly if that cutting is starting to rot, they will go up and move up that rotting tissue into the cutting. Now, perhaps very significantly anyway, is that fungus gnat, both adults and larvae can spread fungal and oomycete pathogens. So oomycetes being Pythium, Phytopithium, Phytophthora, they are fung fungal-like. And then they, so these adults and the larvae, they can take bits of the mycelium and the spores and move them around the media. Obviously adults will move them further because they can fly and they skitter around the top of the media. So they'll pick it up from one area, move it to another. This is bad because, well, you know, you get your larval damage, they start chewing away and nibble the roots, it creates a wound and it can predispose them to infection. Right, and to make matters worse, you know, rotting tissue can Im improve the favorability of the environment for fungus gnat larvae. So in, for fungus gnats, the young plants and seedlings and cuttings that are just starting to put out roots, they are most susceptible. Obviously you take away a small amount of root material when there is only a small amount, it's gonna cause more damage. So mature plants tend not to be damaged unless there's very high numbers and or are susceptible to those plants. So if you would like to share with us the sorts of plant species that you have most issues with, and if you're happy to share that, that's great, and we can we can share that um, at the break or even now if, if you're you know, putting it up on in the comments. However, the soft stemmed species tend to be very susceptible. So things like cyclamen and geraniums, impatiens, poinsettia, begonias, sedums. There's a load of plant species that can be damaged. Really maybe it would be easier to write a list of what's not damaged. Mm. All right. Okay, just moving to the next slide. 
Okay, we're going to move into the effects of growing media because that is very much interlinked with the biology of fungus gnats. As we've sort of indicated previously or alluded to, organic matter and moisture, soil moisture, are the two main factors that influence the favorability of growing media to the fungus gnat larvae. And we're going to talk about both of these in some detail. So growing media that is low in organic matter, particularly things like perlite, biochar, those sorts of media, fungus gnats find it difficult to survive. Media like cocoa, coir, peat, composted pine bark, whether it's hot, hard or soft wood, tend to be relatively suitable for fungus gnats. There is actually no perfect media most medias that are good for propagating plants also tend to be suitable for fungus nets. What is important is the type of fungal growth that is present in the media. And there have been, there's been some research, and I've tried to pull together things that are relatively consistent, but there are some inconsistencies, and so it's it's a bit tricky to give you something that will always work or be, be um, relevant. There's always exceptions, it's a biological system and there are definitely exceptions with fungus gnats. Now, when larvae were fed pure cultures of certain fungi listed here, Trichoderma veri, Botrytis cinerea, Fusarium solana, I don't know what species, Fusarium solana is a species complex, um, they didn't survive or were sterile when they emerged as adults. Now that's pure culture. And to my knowledge, there haven't been uh, tests of these sorts of fungi within a growing media to see if they reduce fungus gnat larvae. Now there are some beneficial fungi and bacteria that have been tested and, they, and sometimes these species have no impact on the survival of larvae and sometimes in most cases plant pathogens that have caused disease in plants so we're talking about diseased plants infected with a plant pathogen tend to increase fungus gnat survival so you have this situation where the adults and larvae feed on them sometimes feed on the plants they might help the plant become infected that will then cause an infection of the plant right, that causes root tissue to break down. Then secondary fungi and bacteria and plus the plant pathogen are around there feeding on the dead and decaying material. The, the fungus gnats go, you beauty, and can feed on it more. So that's the sort of thing that can happen uh, with fungus gnats. And that's how diseased plants or dead plants can increase fungus gnat survival. On the other hand, sterile media under experimental conditions reduces fungus gnat larval survival a lot, so 95%. But we're talking, this is experimental conditions again in small little cups. And plants, I, I should imagine plants in a completely sterile growing media uh, I haven't actually researched that to know, but I, I imagine that that wouldn't be the most optimal sort of growing environment. So we also need to take into account that all media that you receive at your nursery can potentially be infested with fungus gnats. And even bagged media has been shown to be infested with fungus gnats from time to time. Okay, so the growing media has a big impact and the, the exact composition of the growing media can sometimes play a part. And we're going to talk about that more uh, later on in the webinar. So we're going to talk about soil moisture and various tests. Some research is out there to suggest very low moisture does reduce 
larval survival. And most people know this. I imagine who's had that experience where they reduced the watering and they have reduced fungus gnat uh, problems in their propagation area. Just raise your hand if you've experienced that. Yeah, definitely a um, few people uh, raising their hand. Thank you. So there's the research, which there aren't actually that many papers doing the proper research. Maybe it's because everyone already knows. Not sure. Now, on the other hand, very high moisture content sometimes reduces survival, but we're talking 90% soil moisture. That's not great for plant growth either. However, in that paper where they were doing this, some media, the survival of larvae was still pretty high at 90%, but in other medias, the, the larval survival was relatively low and comparable to the 15% moisture. So there are exceptions, and the same with the 50 to 70% moisture, for some media, it was very much reduced compared to other media. And for that reason, it is worthwhile, oh, I thought I had a different slide there. I'm sorry, I'm gonna talk about it now and we'll skip the next slide if it, assuming that, it, that it's in the wrong place. Um, you might wanna test your media, take 30% of some, if you have a mixture that's 30% of pine bark and 30% coir and the remainder of something else, you may want to take that combination and compare it to a different combination for your plants that you grow so that you get relatively optimal growth and have relatively low uh, fungus net issues. You're talking about survival, uh, survival of fungus snaps that, um, or I should say, they don't survive well at 90% and 15% moisture in the soil. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. how long how long can they actually survive at those levels? Mm. Like how, how moist does the soil have to, how long does the soil have to be moist at that level or dry at that level? before the fungus gnats actually die? That's a really good question. That's why I left it for so, you to answer. <laughs> uh, thank you, John. Um, okay. <laughs> so small larvae, regardless of the insect, whether it's a fly larva or a caterpillar or a beetle larva, small, when they're just hatched out of the egg, they are most susceptible to environmental conditions, like adverse environmental conditions for that insect. So the length of time that a very small larva will be able to survive in, um, in growing media is much lower, and probably we're talking days, um, compared to a large larva, which is more able to move lower into the, the container and be resistant. And with that said, it just reminded me, I did read some research that suggested that the eggs dehydrate and die in, when it's very dry. So that's why um, some growers will stick perlite at that top layer and can get some good success. Now I'm interested, uh, does anyone here, has anyone used perlite as that top layer of media in their propagation or in young seedlings, or less likely in seedlings, but in, in cuttings particularly to reduce fungus gnats? Okay, I've had one and so that's, that's great, but that is sometimes useful. And obviously you've got to weigh up whether that works for you, but that is something to keep in mind as an option for that top layer and I like that system because that means that the cutting, the bottom of the cutting produces roots towards the bottom. The perlite uh, supports the cutting, but it, the cutting itself stays dry because cuttings, like plant stems, aren't designed by plants to be stuck in media. We're doing that because it works for propagation. So the less length that the cutting is in the growing media, the less likely you are to have crown rot in that plant down the track. So I, yeah. I like that. 
as well. Sounds fair. So okay. I don't have a specific answer, but that's the general gist. I'm just trying to move to the next slide. Here we go. Okay, cultural practices. Now the cultural practices to prevent fungus gnats sort of naturally flow out of the biology of these insects. So you're going to hear some crossover, obviously using growing media with a low organic matter for propagation will reduce fungus gnat outbreaks, particularly at the top, as we were talking about with perlite at, at the top of the media. Purchasing media that has been sterilized or pasteurized prior to delivery kills all of the stages that happens to be in it. Now keep in mind that as soon as it's been pasteurized and kept at a, a normal temperature, they can potentially be reinfested. And if you've got growing media outside, they can it can be reinfested. Even in a shed, it could potentially be reinfested. But um, we'll, we'll talk about that more in a moment. So basically assume that the media is infested with fungus gnats unless you've shown that it isn't or it's been heat treated by you or someone else recently. Incompletely composted media is more likely to have larger numbers of fungus gnats. And the media storage is important, particularly for coir, make sure it's covered. I like to see media bays covered because that means that it stops rain, it stops organic matter, seed, uh, moving, being blown into your growing media bays. And you can, uh, you can see how the rain and increasing and decreasing temperatures, uh, just being exposed to the environment, you're going to have increased numbers of spores, fungal spores being blown into the media that might just grow just uh, as a secondary, it might have no real impact on the plant, but that can be actually be a food source for the fungus gnats. The rain is moisture, it's going to make that media in the bay, even before you stick it in with a plant, more conducive to fungus gnats. In general, with you know, nice soil moisture, you're going to have more fungus gnats. So have your media bays, wherever they happen to be, well drained and on concrete. That's essential. Uh, uh, it's important to, if you've, anybody has media on soil or are not on concrete, well, know who you are and work to make some changes so that you can have it be more towards best practice. Turn over your media regularly. That helps with reducing breakdown of the media and then of course um, it's sort of that, that's good for all sorts of different reasons but including your uh, fungus gnats. Use the media promptly because then you're less likely to have an infestation of your fungus gnats in in the before it's even gone into your pots and for coir you've got to store them dry. We've seen a number of in instances growers have sent us coir bricks that are just are nothing short of gnarly with fungi, random fungi, not necessarily plant pathogens, but they are so heavily infested that anybody that was thinking about using them, well, just don't do it. It's not, it's not a good look. You're going to have problems with plant growth regardless of the fact that there are no plant pathogens there, that they, they, the coir can become hydrophobic. Um, it's gonna be a great environment for fungus gnats, particularly store them dry, never let them wet. If you receive coir that has been wet before receiving it, gosh, contact your supplier straight away and say, what's going on? What, what? And if you can't use that immediately, um, you got to question the use of that coir in months or years down the track. All right, keep your growing area clean. For so many reasons, including fungus gnats, remove that organic matter that's spilled. Uh, 
take it out of the growing area. I mean, this growing area, obviously they've cleared this area. There's a few spills. Be anal retentive, get rid of that spilled growing media. Any organic matter that breaks down in your growing area is potentially going to be an area that weeds are more likely to grow if you want to manage those, but fungus gnats as well as other, other reasons, other pathogens and whatnot. Um, you're more likely to have algal growth and algae is a good indicator of, of watering, of course. And the more it's clean, the less likely you are to have a problem with fungus gnats and everything else. Investigate plants that are failing to thrive. Maybe it is because the irrigation failed, but maybe it's something something else. If there's evidence of root rot, doesn't in fact matter what it is. You want to remove that from the growing media, from the growing area. I would recommend sending some plants to Grow Help if there's evidence of root rot, and we can test to see if there's a pathogen or if there was evidence that perhaps it was a non-pathogenic issue. Discard dead plants hygienically off-site. I tell people quite frequently my uh, dislike of compost heaps. Who has a compost heap on site? Just raise your hand for me, please. I understand the practical benefits. There are a couple of people raising their hand. That's great. Um, it's particularly bad when the compost heap drains into the recycled dam. And you can see what happens. You've got a dead plant, or even not a dead plant, a healthy plant, it gets stuck on the compost heap, it breaks down. That is, and who's seen compost heaps just riddled with fungus gnats? Um, whether it's on your property or somewhere else, raise your hand for me if you have. I certainly have, or I, but I don't think I can raise my hand. I never thought about it. Anyway. Um, and then you may have a pathogen in there. Yes, I see those hands raised, thank you. You then can be putting your pathogen back onto your plants. I've seen this happen with Phytophthora time, time again, and it's a sad state of affairs. Get rid of your dead plants off site. And I would recommend if you have a compost seed, compost heap on site, ensure that it doesn't flow into your recycled water or even have it anywhere near your growing area. Gosh, that's just increasing your risk of reinfestation of pests and pathogens. All right, fertilize the minimum amount to achieve optimal growth. So over fertilizing, you're more likely to have algal growth, you're more likely to have, um, well, your plant can't make use of it anyway, so what, what's the point? Check your incoming stock for pests and including fungus gnats, and spend more time on high value, highly susceptible crops. Um, it's hard to say how long, that's gonna depend on the size of the area, the size of the plants, and how valuable it is, how many pests there, there are. Your supplier, if you know that, if you for some reason had to purchase from a, a grower that maybe sometimes hasn't had the best stock, you might want to hold them a little bit longer and check them a little more thoroughly um, so that you don't introduce things into your main area. And modify your growing area to stop water pooling. And that's good for a lot of different reasons, but you know, your stops back, um, you're less likely to have uh, slippage, you know, people slipping, there's, it's, I mean, it's so much nicer walking through a nursery when there are uh, pools of water and it's um, important for fungus gnats as well. Okay, modify your irrigation. This one is very important to the minimum required to keep plants growing optimally. And people compromise with this for all sorts of reasons, practical concerns. Ultimately, there are more and more tools available to us to understand what is happening in the pot. There are Bluetooth devices that you can connect so that they just pair to your phone as you walk past, and it will tell you the soil moisture in that particular pot. There are more integrated systems like this Agnivate, which is pretty impressive, I must admit. 
where they can have sensors to um, detect soil moisture, pH of the, of the soil and of water, and same with EC, leaf wetness, various different uh, nutrient ions, and a, a heap of other in environmental conditions and, and tons of different growing parameters that are basically in real time, you know, taking measurements every 10 minutes in some cases and can alert you to problems. You tie that in with your irrigation system, it is a lot easier to ensure that you don't overwater. Obviously, that is a, 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 a cost. Um, from what I understand, Activate is pretty reasonable, depending on how much and what parameters you want to measure. So I recommend you looking into it for your nursery or another system that is similar and modify your irrigation system, particularly for your high risk and high value areas where you can um, get the highest return for investment, particularly your, in your propagation areas that can be like that. So that you don't overwater and can reduce fungus nets passively. Who's, who's got a system that helps them monitor soil moisture? Please raise your hand. And okay, there are there's one. If you don't mind uh, just typing in your experience with it, and uh, if you don't mind it being shared, that'd be awesome. But otherwise, we'll keep on moving. We can share that later in the webinar. Okay, uh, we've talked a little bit about modifying your growing media composition. I would recommend reducing the amount of peat unless you can be very sure that it is also not containing plant pathogens. Certainly there are cases where we see peat with coming in complete with pythium. Um, so not, not great, not always, but sometimes it happens. So as we've talked about yeah, previously, different media compositions can reduce fungus gnat populations. However, really in the research that I read, it wasn't very consistent across plant species. And so it's hard to say, do this or that. It really will depend on your growing environment, the plant species that you are growing. So try it out, have multiple treatments, compare the number of fungus gnats potentially by uh, monitoring with yellow sticky traps. Who has yellow sticky traps in their propagation area? Just raise your hand for me. One, two, three, four, okay, a few, a few, a few of you do, that's great. Now, I'm just gonna lower your hands. Okay, everyone's done it. Who counts the number of fungus gnats on those sticky traps on a regular basis, maybe, maybe every one to two weeks. Anybody? Raise your hand if you do. All right, well, I'm going to be a little bit of a devil's advocate here and just say for small yellow sticky traps that have the little lines on them, you know, the ones that are 10 by 20 centimeters, they are a monitoring tool if you aren't counting the number of fungus gnats in some way or another then it really is a feel-good exercise and you may as well not spend the money on them now i'm not saying don't count them i'm saying count them don't let your sticky trap turn into this this is useless for a small sticky trap i'm trying to make there's the red x that's not good Get the large rolls of yellow sticky trap to do mass trapping. Let the large rolls, you can buy them from a number of suppliers uh, and put them in strategic areas of your propagation area so that you don't get the sticky on you and get the antidote, which is the citrus um, sol solvents that dissolve it and various other yuck off. There are various products that can um, get rid of the sticky from your clothes and hands. Use the large rolls for mass trapping. 
use the small sticky traps for monitoring numbers over time so that you can have an idea of increasing populations or decreasing populations and whether or not you need to take further action to reduce fungus gnat populations. Also keep in mind that the number of adults on the traps may not always correlate to the amount of damage that you're receive, your plants are receiving. And this could be because for some, whatever reason, the population structure just has more larvae and they haven't started emerging as adults yet. Or it could be that you have a particularly susceptible plant, so you don't need that many, or a particular susceptible stage where you don't need that many larvae or that many adults to start seeing damage. And by contrast, sometimes you can have loads of adults on the sticky traps, but you're not growing susceptible plants, and so you don't see damage. So you've got to understand your plants and um, the situation for you at your nursery. Now, there are ways of monitoring the number of flies that emerge from media. And unfortunately, I don't have a photo that I really wanted, which is basically a takeaway container with a known volume of growing media. Depends on the size of your media. Maybe you've got um, three or 500 mil in a large takeaway container, cut a hole in the lid, put fly screen down, put the lid back on so that the fungus gnats can't get out, put a yellow, a small section of a yellow sticky trap. And that will help you count the number of adults that emerge from it. It will tell you how many adult fungus gnats are in there over a period of time. And you can use that with different growing media and work out relatively how much is there. You could also do that, but the reason I use this picture is because you could do the same thing by cutting off the lid um, putting your fly screen down with a rubber band or a sticky tape or whatever. Um, uh, Seely's All Clear is a great glue for uh, fly screen and meshes. You can put a yellow sticky trap in there with the plant and you can see just how many flies are emerging from a small container. So you can modify that depending on your needs, larger bottles for larger plants and so on and so forth. Hopefully that's helpful. Um, larvae can be monitored with potato pieces. Has anyone ever done that? Just raise your hand um, if you've ever used, used the potato yet yeah, one. Okay, they can be a little bit messy, a couple of you. Okay, great. But basically you're using cut potato pieces with the peeling up. The peeling is important because it helps to reduce the rot. And who knows, rotten potatoes, they're gross. So you don't want to leave them in the growing media with the cut side down for all that long, 48 hours, take them out. So mark the location with a flag or something that you can easily go back to because disintegrating rotten potato in your potted plant, yuck. And it's just gonna feed your growing your, your fungus gnats. The small larvae are relatively difficult to detect and they'll go back into the media quite quickly. So you've got to look at the media first and then the potato peel to see what the potato uh, cut surface to see how many larvae are there. That can work. Um, I wouldn't necessarily go to that effort if the sticky traps can work for you. Just moving to the next slide. Record your data electronically. John and I can have talked about this. If you've seen one of our other webinars or workshops, we're constantly talking about recording your data electronically. The filing cabinet just is pretty inefficient. Electronic data can be shared, it can be searched. Um, it's a lot easier to make it so it doesn't get lost. Excuse me, one moment. Okay. Um, there are also more sophisticated systems that are being developed, particularly if you're an IASA. Is anyone from, uh, from an IASA nursery? Just raise your hand for me. Um, yes, at least one. Great. Uh, yep, a few of you, that's great. Who has used the audit management system? One, I'd love to hear your comments. And just if you don't want them to be shared, just please indicate them. Uh, yeah, I'd love to hear your, your um, experience with that system because it potentially, I mean, I see the potential for it becoming a system that is very valuable where you can report plant health issues and different aspects of your growing media practices 
and be able to search them and keep records of them uh, in, a, in an integrated system that is quite valuable. Uh, all right. Any questions at this point? And I think we yep. also have a poll after this. Yeah, we do, Andrew. There was an interesting one which I want to share with everyone and get your feedback on. Uh, yep. How do you manage the risk of sticky traps trapping or injuring wildlife such as birds and lizards? So thanks, Sabine, for that question. Oh, the poor little tackers. Um, I guess some sticky traps are better than others. I particularly like the sticky traps that have the paper. Um, however, with the paper you peel off, um, there are some systems where you can put the sticky trap in a large mesh plastic thing um, where it, basically, it helps to stop larger organism animals from getting stuck on them. If you are consistently getting lizards and other small vertebrates on your traps, I would try placement, see if the placement of them can help. Um, or, I mean, maybe just evaluate whether it's worth it for you. The, the, to a certain extent, it's going to be difficult. Or if you're doing it in a propagation area that stops birds from moving in. I don't know. What do you think, John? I know <clears throat> some of the small sticky traps have holes top and bottom, so you can easily suspend them on wire or string rather than having them on a flat surface. So I guess something like that would help with your lizards. Your birds mm. could be a little bit trickier because they quite likely want to perch on it and pluck any insects off. But yeah, like you said, if they're in an enclosed area, an enclosed um, propagation house, birds shouldn't be an issue. But certainly mm. lizards, whether it's geckos, because I know I have them in a plant room on the research station here and we're constantly getting small geckos getting trapped on the sticky trap um, just because they're after the insects. Uh, but yeah, suspending them on wire um, could be an option in some situations. Mm. I would have thought most birds would be able to get off, but I suppose various wrens and whatnot could potentially have problems. Okay. And I, and I guess having that sticky stuff on their beak would not be very mm. tasteful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Biological control. There are quite a few predators available commercially. Two predatory mites that go through growing media and soil. One rove beetle. There's the insect eating nematodes. And Bt is also a biological control agent. So your vector back is a biopesticide. It's an, a bacteria. So I consider that still to be biological control. They really are best applied preventatively as part of a regular management action, preferably whenever potting up and on a regular basis in your propagation areas thereafter. So insecticides will damage, will, will reduce your predator populations. Try and avoid using your organophosphates, so things like diazinon and um, or, um, dimethoate, those sorts of things. Most carbamates, with the exception of pyramor, that aphid-specific product, fipronil, that's a terrible products for human safety anyway. The same with the organophosphates, pyrethroids, neonicotinoids have a pretty broad spectrum, and they will damage your predator populations. The low-risk products may still reduce survival of your predators, and also then may cause them to not live as long, or may they may lay fewer, fewer eggs. So even though they, su they survive, they may be negatively affected in some ways. So just keep that in mind as you're using basically any insecticide that these things can happen. And there is a fact sheet with more information on managing predators uh, that I'll send a link in that follow-up email. Okay, so hypoaspis, 
the, that used to be the genus name of the, the two different species of mites that are commercially available uh, through these different providers in Australia. I think I got them all, certainly tried. Um, one is only produced by biological services, the other by a few of you, a few producers. They are large, for well, mites, they're large. They, they are for one, about one millimeter for a mite, that's large. They're soil dwelling. They feed on fungus gnat larvae and pupae, thrips pupae, and various other small invertebrates. They are active with soil temperatures between about 10 and 30 degrees. So most propagation areas where you're growing plants, these things will be affected. And they do live for several months. Because they don't have wings, they only have legs, they do need to be spread evenly, but they'll stick in your growing media for quite some time. So again, these things are awesome. I noticed that only a few of you in the survey use these things. They can be very effective. The Losha is a beetle. It's a small beetle, three to four mils. They can fly. This is the, the main difference. They eat similar things. They have a similar effect, but they can, the adults can fly. So they will move around a little bit more. But they're probably also a little bit more susceptible to pesticides because they move around that bit more. So this is the, how they look. The adults, their wings are under here. The adults curl their abdomen up and uh, over their head sort of thing when they're running around. Larvae look like this. And we put this in here so that you can see the difference between a fungus gnat larva, which was mostly white, had that black head, whereas these, the Delosha, had the brown head. And the, the Delosha are distinctly segmented, and you can see they have legs. So that should help you with distinguishing fungus gnat larvae from Delosha if you start using them. You can use them in conjunction with the, fung with the hypoasphysis mites, and they can be very effective. Likewise, insect eating nematodes, this gnat nem, it's one particular species of nematode that can be very effective against fungus gnats. Who's used these uh, nematodes in the past? Just raise your hand for me when you're ready. They basically enter the host, they kill it within a couple of days, they then release more nematodes into the media. They can be used applied with a knapsack, a watering can, anything that doesn't have a pump sprayers where the filters have all been removed. They are UV sensitive, so you can't really apply them during daylight hours unless the environment is UV filtered. What is nice is that you can get a large pack if you need them over successive weeks. You can get a large pack, store them in the fridge. Um, so just contact Eco grow saying I want to store I'm going to get a large pack and use them over the next three weeks so that they give you uh, the most um, most recently apply, uh, produced pack. Okay, and BT is similar except that it's a bacteria, not an nematode, and the bacteria has to be ingested by the fungus gnat larvae. This subspecies is Raleigh only kills fly larvae and incidentally is what is used in rivers for killing um, mosquito larvae and whatnot. It's ingested, so it's ingested by the larvae, it secretes, the bacteria secretes this product, it disrupts cell function, they basically disintegrate, it's a biopesticide. This product is UV sensitive, so you do need to apply it in morning or late afternoon. And the important other information about this product is that it has a lifespan. It's a living product. Get the, um, the dry formulation and check the production date when you're purchasing it. Make sure that it's as, as recent as possible and make sure you store it so that it's not gonna have fluctuating temperatures or um, be exposed to sun because that will reduce the lifespan of that product substantially. Okay, so at low levels of fungus gnats with biological control, you put it in at propagation, regardless of whether you're using Delosha or mites, um, nematodes, nematodes or EBT. I prefer for preventative levels, do the mites or Delosha or both at propagation and a fortnight later. Get those populations established and then 
let them continue. And hopefully that's gotten you over the high risk periods for those plants. If you get start getting moderate levels of fungus gnats, apply a higher rate and perhaps do so in weekly consecutive weeks. And at higher rates, you will start to get a feel as you use these products, what rate you need for the level of population that you've got. And you can also then add in things like a BT and your nematode applications uh, to drop the populations down similar to the insecticides while still not having an effect, a negative effect on your beneficials. All right, moving right along because we are realize we are getting over time um, very shortly. Anyway, the pesticides that are currently either registered or have a minor use permit for fungus gnats are listed here. There are some broad, broad spectrum. Again, I don't recommend using these except if you absolutely have to. The diazinon triprinol high health risks, neonicotinoids, there are issues with certain retail suppliers, so you'd be aware of those. Um, the lower risk products, as a direction, it's a good product, it can be effective. Some claim that it has a low impact on um, predators, and that may well be true, um, at least for certain predators. And then there are a few immature growth regulators. These products are low risk and they will likely have some negative impacts on your predators. However, they, they are best applied relatively, if you're going to use pesticides, apply them early in the piece because they only, they will act more strongly on smaller larvae. So immature growth regulators, as the name suggests, it regulates the growth of immature stages of insects um, and stops them from being able to molt or otherwise uh, impairs their, their ability to develop so that they don't emerge as an adult. Okay. When you're using any of these products, whether it be the nematodes, the BT product or your pesticides, you've got to make sure that you apply the correct amount of water post product application. Use too much, it will go out the bottom of the pot or go down too low into the media. Use too little and it doesn't get to um, where the fungus nets are, that two to five centimeters, you know, the first portion of the media, you'll get less coverage. We've talked about the impact on predators. It's important to, whenever you're using pesticides, regardless of the pest, keep track of the efficacy of that product. Go back, monitor your populations of pests, make sure that they have been effective. Then, if there's ever a time when an application is ineffective and it used to be effective, you can start to go, hold on, did I apply this wrong? Was there a mistake in the rate or the nozzles? Or do I need to clean my um, nozzles or recalibrate? Or is there actually a situation where you might suspect there to be pesticide resistance? Now for fungus gnats, there are no reported cases of insecticide resistance in Australia. Overseas, there are a few species that have had instances of um, scientifically proven pesticide resistance, but not for the species we have in Australia. Now that doesn't mean that it will, will never happen. Uh, it's just something to be aware of and Eventually, if you use products enough, it's possible to cause pesticide resistance. Out of interest, has anybody seen a situation where they are convinced that they've had pesticide resistance for fungus gnats? Just raise your hand. Okay, one. All right, be interested to hear your experience uh, with that and, um, and how you determined that it was definitely pesticide resistance 
and not another problem. Um, so if you want to share that with us, that would be awesome, but we don't need to share that with, with everyone. All right, so in summary, really, if you keep your growing area clean, don't over irrigate, store your growing media well, apply biocontrol agents and tend to use your low risk pesticides first, you should be able to manage fungus gnats effectively. Any final questions? One here, Andrew. Um, yep. With the use of your IGRs, your in insect growth mm -hmm. regulators or immature growth regulators, do any actually work on the eggs or is it just the larvae? Ooh, John, can I, I'm the kind of friend. John, do you know? <laughs> I know uh, from my experience with whitefly, there was one that affected the eggs more than the larvae. Um, I, from the top of my head, I can't remember which one that was, but that was for a different group of insects altogether. Um, and I don't know the ones that you've mentioned whether they will or not. Um, yeah. There are probably some out there, but how effective they are, yeah. Again, I'm not sure. Mm. And one question that's just popped up, does a general mm -hmm. fly spray have some effect on the adult population? Okay, that's a good question. And yes, fly spray, um, will have, I mean, synthetic pyrethroid in most cases. So they have a very broad spectrum effect on many insects, including fungus gnats. Now, if you are putting fly spray on plants, the propellant used in the fly spray can cause a burn or a phytotoxicity on your plants. So you've got to make sure that you have them relatively far away from your plants. Now I'm not saying go and do that. I actually prefer that you use other methods because I mean, you knock down the adults and they're not the damaging stage. It's, it's the larval stage. And so hopefully you can manage the larval. I know they lay eggs, but if you manage your irrigation, you can reduce um, egg lay just by having drier media. So there are other ways, probably wouldn't focus so much on knockdown for adults, but perhaps in a very uh, high level, that would be a sort of maybe useful. I, I guess too, from the point of view that general fly spray, if you've got any airborne, like your Delosia, beneficial insects, it's probably going to take care of those ones as well at the same time, which is not what you want. Beautiful. All right. If, uh... so thanks everyone for attending and we'll see you at the next webinar.